Size Norton, Britain's largest military airbase. 8,000 men and women serve and live in a thriving community the size of a small town. It operates 24 hours a day with seven flying squadrons, two parachute units, our race going now. A world-class aeromedical evacuation unit. This is our number one priority, get this guy home. And an airport that dispatches and receives thousands of troops back home from war zones. I'm so excited, I want to cry. The most seasoned professionals rub shoulders with the newest recruits. Train hard, fight easy. Done correctly, it's a work of art. But it's more than just a military base. Supporting operations in Afghanistan, hosting traditional historic celebrations to the saddest of all occasions. Everything stops for the repatriation to take effect. Inside RAF Bryce Norton. In this episode, emergency crews are scrambled as a Hercules landing gear fails. C-130 aircraft malfunction indicated on undercarriage. The UK reservists undergo gruelling parachute training for the front line. Not all will make the grade. And the local community prepares for a repatriation. These walls are just dripping with grief and it, it isn't easy for people. Bryce Norton is home to around a sixth of the RAF's personnel. As the UK's main air link to Afghanistan, preparing for the front line is a constant priority. Whether it's dispatching men or cargo, refueling fighter aircraft or rapid deployment behind the lines, Bryce provides the expertise. At the core of this is flight training across the varied fleet of aircraft that regularly serve Camp Bastion. Weekly, around 100 training flights take off from the runway. Today, it's the turn of Annabelle Bacon, a pilot on the RAF's largest and fastest cargo aircraft, the C-17 Globemaster. It regularly flies to and from Afghanistan, non-stop. C-17 is quite a heavy beast. It's absolutely designed for heavy lift capability. It has great performance. Um, when it's light, you'll find that it'll rock it up out of the sky like a, like a roller coaster ride. It's actually the only aircraft I've ever flown uh, that's bigger than a nine-seater business jet. Annabelle joined the RAF after being in the Officer Training Corps at university. I didn't really know anything at all about aviation. I had a chat with um, a wing commander in the careers office and he was all very keen and before I knew it, I was going through selection and they offered me a job to be a pilot. So I thought, wow, uh, that's real. Regular postings to Afghanistan have an impact on her personal life. It's very difficult to go on a date with the same person more than once because either they get bored or they meet someone else in the time you've been away or they can't handle it or I suppose they just don't like you enough. But <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it makes it hard, definitely. On this trip, Annabelle is doing a combat manoeuvre called Touch and Go. First, the aircraft makes an extra steep approach to the runway and after landing, has to immediately take off again. Manoeuvres like this are used at night in Afghanistan, both to limit the time aircraft are low in the sky and vulnerable to enemy fire, and to abort a landing should an emergency arise on the runway. The C-17 weighs 128 tonnes and is capable of descending at a rapid 20,000 feet a minute, ten times faster than many other aircraft. I always get a bit more tense when it comes to landing the plane because the very nature of ground versus aircraft means, you know, you make sure you get it right. Landing and takeoff are the most challenging aspects of learning to fly. Annabelle is training with squadron leader Dave Blakemore. We're uh, about 300 feet above the ground. The crew are already thinking about the attitude of the aircraft before the landing and then how they're safely going to get airborne again. So 50, 50, 50 feet now, we'll apply the power. That arrests the rate of descent. The aircraft will touch down, they'll control the nose wheel. 
flaps will travel to the half position and then apply the power ready to get the aircraft airborne again. And that's the power coming on now. Emergency state 2, C-130 aircraft, 10 miles out to land, 3 POB, malfunction indicated on undercarriage. A nearby Hercules aircraft is in distress and has reported that its landing gear could collapse on touchdown. Annabelle and her crew need to get back to Bryce Norton urgently. We've just had some news about the, the Hercules in the circuit. They're going to be attempting to land in about 20 to 30 minutes time. Um, so obviously if they have an emergency, there's only the one runway here at Bryce. Uh, and there is the potential that they could um, be using the runway for quite a period of time. So what we're intending to do is I'll jump in the seat and then we'll try and land before the Hercules lands. Annabelle's training has come to a premature end. They'll be preparing for a crash landing. They'll have probably gone through their crash evacuation checklist. The ambulance will be standing by, there'll be fire engines standing by. They'll follow them down the runway as they land, uh, just in case. While the Hercules prepares for an emergency landing by burning off fuel, the C-17 must land as quickly as possible, which means coming in fast and braking hard. The Hercules can now begin its descent into Bryce Norton. The emergency has even attracted a crowd of plane spotters who have tuned in to the cockpit radio. Thankfully, on touchdown, the landing gear holds out and danger is averted. The emergency crews are stood down. It's not just air crew and troops that need preparing for frontline deployment. Training the office workers who sit behind a desk doing admin is also critical. Even established bases like Camp Bastion can fall under unexpected attack. Squadron leader Mal Craig, who works in the Air Transport Force HQ, will be posted to the coalition base of Kandahar in four weeks' time. The aircraft is the, the front of house, the, 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 the main ticket item, which everybody sees. You know, it's a big, shiny, nice, sexy aeroplane. Um, what they don't see is the fact that do we have enough uh, baggage containers for it? Do we have uh, enough towing arms? Is the, is, the, is the jack in the right place? Do we have enough chocks for it? All those little bits go together to make the fact that the aircraft can go away on time and get the troops away in place. Mal will be leaving his family behind. His wife is a commercial cabin crew manager and his two children are off to boarding school. He's been in the business of moving aircraft for 23 years, but when it comes to protecting himself with a pistol, he's a novice. I come from a, a long line of farming families in Cumbria. I'm the only person in my family who's, uh, who's joined the military. In Afghanistan, Mal will never be apart from his regulation pistol. Sleeping with it on standby will be routine for the next four months. I'll be issued with a, uh, a pistol. Uh, that will be my personal weapon, and that will stay with me 24 hours a day for the whole uh, tour. Uh, everything from you know going down the gym, uh, it'll have a pistol right next to the uh, treadmill uh, to go into the cookhouse as well, uh, right into the normal working office environment. In Afghanistan, Mal's life may depend on the Browning 9mm pistol, so he needs to be able to use it effectively. Mal has only ever used a rifle before. A pistol requires different skills. After a day of intensive shooting, the instructor feeds back. Pass mark is 23, so you need 23 to actually pass the ACMT. Uh, 29 for lane 1, 24 was lane 2, lane 3, 26, and lane 4, 31. 
He's passed, and with the best score. Very much so, very much so. Mal's completed the first step of training, getting that little bit closer to his deployment to Kandahar, along with his potential lifesaver, the Browning 9mm. In only about six weeks' time, it'll be uh, my primary weapon events, and uh, it'll go everywhere with me for all the four or five months after that. Next, squadron leader Mal Craig comes under fire in his preparations for the front line. Wounded man! Wounded man! And the local community of Carterton come together as a fallen soldier is repatriated. We can identify just a little bit with the service families that are going through this terrible ordeal. Training personnel for combat in hostile territories like Afghanistan is critical. Today, in a field near Bryce Norton, squadron leader Mal Craig is undergoing hostile environment training for his upcoming deployment. My normal everyday job at my rank is working at a computer, working at a keyboard, uh, working on the phones, um, planning, organising. Mal's exercise ends with a simulated attack on a compound. Training for violent scenarios like this is key for all military personnel in the field. It's very physical. It's very physical. I work in an office and it's exhausting, you know, I'm not used to wearing this equipment. But the lads out on the ground working in 40 plus degrees of heat uh, with the constant threat of mines or constant uh, stress of potentially uh, being attacked or shot at, uh, and it really shows the, you know, the, what a professional force we have in both the RAF regiment and in the, the infantry as well. Delta, are you all right? If you see me on the gate, then the war's going pretty bad. Mal will be living 24-7 in a desert camp in hostile territory. The final appointment for all personnel before deployment is a visit to the clothing stores on base. Margaret Ferguson has seen big changes in the kit since she first started working here 12 years ago. Underwear, the normal The uniform itself is a lot better. Um, it's a lot cooler for them. Their boots are much better. The body armour is better. This would be the bulk area, which is the main bit, which is on top. It's got all your webbing and everything can, uh, is attached to that. They have to put it together themselves and a lot of people like the underwear and socks. It's an antibacteria underwear, so they have another bit like a padding over the top of that and it protects them in their manhood, really. So wives and girlfriends will be pleased about that. And your laundry bags. At the moment, there's um, a shortage of the patrol bags. We're really busy at the moment with the, the operations going on in the Middle East and Afghanistan. I've given you gloves. Yes, we do have a lot of youngsters that are first tours and that. Uh, I know they're supposed to be grown lads, but you feel a little bit responsible for them because I've got children of my own and some of them are around about my son's age. So I think with my son, I think of these people going out and I wouldn't want him going out. That's your helmet. I do feel that I would like to give a motherly thing and make sure they know that I've given them all the equipment they need and that and we've made them as safe as we can. It's now Mal's turn to get kitted out. We're going to go a full kitting for Full you. kitting, please, yes. Um, we'll start with the clothing mm -hmm. and that, and hopefully I've got the right sizes for you and you've been honest with me, OK? That's it. <laughs> we'll ask them their waist size if they tell us the fib. We usually go up a bit and we're usually right nine times out of ten. We've got a few that like um, the trousers to fit nice around the bum. As a 23-year veteran of the RAF, Mal's no stranger to working in war zones. The first time I went out, I was about, you know, I was about 24 and didn't know anything. I'm 43 now. Um, I've been out to Iraq, you know, half a dozen times and, you know, now I'm off to uh, Afghanistan and uh, this is the kit I'll be going with. You know, I'm not doing, not doing any job particularly different to what I'm doing now. The difference is that you're going into a place where people don't like you and uh, you are a target. Um, you know, and I, I've been in... I've been in places, you know, on a, on a previous tour, uh, we took over 100 rockets uh, in, in the tour. 
After an hour, Mal is completely kitted out. Mm -hmm. He's now fully equipped and ready to depart. So there's the kidding for a six month debt to Afghanistan. But it's not a cool place to be. It's, uh, it's to be honest, it's a place to be. Um, you know, but it's the job that we joined up to do. You feel for them going out, you know, and you just hope that they come back again. But on the front line, there are always casualties of war. Most service personnel who are on operations overseas are repatriated via RAF Bryce Norton, which took over the duty in September 2011 due to the closure of RAF Lynham. On a repatriation day, just before 1.30 p.m., all movement at Bryce Norton stops, and the C-17 from Camp Bastion comes into land. Crowds gather in the town of Carterton on the perimeter of the base to show their respects. The focus is the memorial garden with its bell, funded by donations from the local community. A young person, a citizen of our nation, who chose to wear the uniform of our nation, has lost his life. Yeah, and there can't be any higher price than that. A small number of immediate family members are invited to attend the intimate repatriation ceremony inside the base. The community of Carterton has taken on the role of hosting the wider family of the bereaved and volunteers, whenever necessary, transform the local sports pavilion into a support centre for these relatives and friends. The repatriations have been passed to us to deal with and we just try to do it with dignity and grace. These walls are just dripping with grief and it, it isn't easy for people. Inside the sports pavilion, a devoted team of local women make sandwiches and tea for those close to the bereaved. Our f husbands were service people, so in our lives we've experienced a lot of turmoil and concern and, you know, where are they? So in a way, we can identify just a little bit with the service families that are going through this terrible ordeal. So we come and we smile and we make coffee and tea and we try and make the day as easy and as friendly and as calm as possible. As the repatriations attract large crowds wishing to pay their respects, Oxfordshire Council has a team to help with logistics, and for them it's much more than a routine job. You know, it does bring a bit of a lump to the throat. Of course it does, you know, you wouldn't be human if it doesn't, but, um, you know, we're just here to help and make it run smoothly. I've done all the repatriations now except for one. Every, every one is different and I treat everyone as different and it still upsets me and I, I think it obviously will until such time as they're not coming through anymore. So. The Chequers pub in the village of Bryce Norton is the first focal point on the repatriation route. It's the most important thing as far as I'm concerned in the world. Let's face it, I mean these are, these are people's sons and it could be daughters as well. And if it's the least people can do is to show their respect for something that's happening all the time. Stand up, Ferris! Curry! Stand up! The Raider to the front! Salute! The cortege then moves from the village of Bryce Norton to the adjacent town of Carterton, where the family, regiment and crowds of mourners are waiting. In the first year of operation, there were 46 repatriations in Bryce Norton. It brings home that people do die in war and uh, we need to show respect to these soldiers who are coming back and, and giving their lives and they're so young as well, a lot of them. And it's not good to see anybody upset or any, see any grief, but 
you know, if, if it gets a message home, possibly that we don't want to do anything like this again, then so be it. I defy anybody to stand there and say that they, they don't feel something, you know, when you, when you see the, the relatives and the families, when the coffin comes past, you, you know, I'm, I mean, they're all servicemen, they're giving their lives for this country. I go home and I, I actually cry, so it's, for me, it's quite an emotional experience. I have a real problem with yet another one of our young men not coming back home in one piece to his family. I, that is always, for all of us, we all feel, can I say, well I will say, I think it's such a waste. From those who stand along this route, a statement that's sincere. They mark all that was given by the fallen who pass here. The colours they are proud to raise, to fight for and to die. They lower them, salute with pride, the fallen that pass by. Next, a new intake of the Territorial Army prepare for their first parachute jump before deployment to Afghanistan. Want it over and done with. Not nervous. And an American pilot practices low-level combat flying. It's a 40 million pound aircraft signed to you and told to, to go out and take care of it. Dispatching troops by parachute is one of the most effective ways to penetrate behind enemy lines or capture areas inaccessible by road. All of the UK's military prepare for such missions at number one parachute training school, RAF Bryce Norton. You don't have to put your helmets on just yet. Today's intake is four para, a territorial army unit. That's it, lads, let's get these reserves off then. Let's get these lads up into the flight swings. The Territorial Army is made up of civilian men and women, some as young as 18, who give their spare time to serve as fully trained soldiers, providing vital support to the army. They are part of the UK's military reserve of 38,000 men and women, and they form more than a fifth of the overall manpower of the nation's forces. These soldiers are training for deployment to Afghanistan. Position, holding on to the front risers, elbows in, Looking below us. One of the Army volunteers is 27-year-old Private James Sharp. After two years in the Territorial Army, he's given up his day job working in a coffee shop to live out his ambition to play his part on the front line. I don't see much point in keeping my job on, but I did work in Starbucks at the time, so I can make a good coffee, supposedly. <laughs> but I've quit that just now because I'm going on operations in Harry Katyn in Afghanistan, so... If Sharp passes the course, he will soon be serving alongside regular soldiers. 32-year-old Jamie Kerr, a student, has come from four paras unit in London to complete his training. Well, we're hopefully going to be uh, jumping this evening, so uh, just uh, just excited and just keen to keen to get out there and uh, and get it done, get the first one out of the way. Wider, 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 wider. The Territorial Army attracts a wide range of recruits. 37-year-old Mo Khan is a hospital anaesthetist in Southend-on-Sea. This is going to be my, my first jump, um, so I'm starting to get, get, get a few nerves, but I think that's, that's probably quite a good thing. There's a, a little bit of nervous excitement starting to uh, creep up. Chip canopy! Canopy is good! Carry on! And 20-year-old Michael Lister, normally a lifeguard, is determined to make the grade. There's a few nerves kicking around, but they're just all of them are just like getting a bit nervous, waiting around, but they just want to get get the first jump over and done with, then crack on with the second, third and fourth, then night jump. On the high tower, fellow trainee Sharp is having a few reservations. I've never done anything like this in my life before, you know. I'm totally scared of heights. So the first one on the um, platforms there, you are at the bottom, you're like, oh it doesn't look too high. And once you get up, you're like, oh wait, it is high. <laughs> The speed at which the um, cable brings them down is the closest that uh, they're going to get in any of the ground training to uh, the actual rate of descent they'll get on the low-level parachute. So a bit more fear factor into it, adding a bit of height into it as well. You're here to conquer your fears, you know what I mean? Conquer your fears at this stage would prepare you to go over there and 
face like the worst possible scenario. My first parachute jump, I was, I'll just say myself. I'm not going to say anything else. I was absolutely bricking it. The most important thing is that I'm going with, with my mates. I'm going with Liam here. He's one of my, one of my boys, Jamie Kale. We're all going to Afghanistan, so that's it. There's people who are actually going to Afghanistan on this course as well, so it's a good brotherhood, you know, it's building. This is the foundations. Tomorrow will be a testing day for the new brotherhood of recruits. They will all jump from an aircraft for the first time as part of their training for Afghanistan. They will be jumping from a Hercules aircraft, the workhorse of the RAF. With many aircraft currently on deployment in Afghanistan, the Hercules specializes in dropping supplies and troops to remote, inaccessible areas. Training for these low-level combat missions takes place at Bryce Norton. Hello, could I get some aircraft details, please? Thanks. Piloting today's exercise is Justin Tubiolo, here on a three-year exchange program from the USA. Justin is part of 24 Squadron, they fly Hercules transporter aircraft on missions and carry out airdrops. And it's here that he's picked up one of the great British traditions. I drink a little bit of tea now. I never drank tea or coffee really before. You have to have some warm tea once in a while. And it's when it only gets up to 15 degrees all summer. Today, Justin is going on a low-level flying exercise in the Welsh Valleys to simulate the risks of flying in Afghanistan's mountainous terrain. Are you guys 211 Bravo? 210, 211? On the airfield, the Hercules is being prepared for Justin's low-level flying exercise. Hercules, yeah, it's a great name. It, it sounds a little tougher, I think, than just going with the C-130. It's an awesome aircraft. You can fly it with just a three-person crew, and you can do such a wide variety of missions, and that's really uh, why it's been around for so long and so successful and why it's so, so much fun to fly. I'm going to have a pee and then we'll crank it. <laughs> Not about to see. That'll be good. Check. Roger. Radex. Reset. Justin and his crew head west to train over more testing terrain. All right, mate. In a combat zone like Afghanistan, if you fly low between the mountains, you can use them as a shield from a rocket attack. If there's a big mountain between someone with a surface-to-air missile and us, then they can't see us. And if they can't see us, they can't shoot us. I've only been fired at in Iraq, never in Afghanistan, personally. In combat, it's really dependable. It could take some enemy fire and, and still keep on going. With four engines, the chances of something terrible happen are, are really slim. You want me to fly over the bridge? Uh, rather than up there, yeah, that'd be great. We're all aware of how serious our job is, and it can be dangerous at times, so a little moment of uh, banter once in a while lightens the mood and is, is necessary. Blessed super nightmare. Oh, no, that one is. Those little worm things in the sand are disgusting. Luck worms. I don't know. Good bait for fishing, though. They're very good bait, yeah. Once in Wales, oh, Justin nice negotiates his way through the valleys, with just 250 feet between his Hercules and the ground below. Flying low level is uh, one of the preferred methods in Afghanistan to, to keep you out of danger from threats that could engage you. It's a lot more difficult flying low level, obviously, because you have to pay a lot more attention to hitting the ground, which will kill you quicker than anything else out there will. Pylons going up three miles, quite low. Uh, Roger, holding height, they got 400 feet. Freeze at 4 o'clock. Roger, coffee. Roger, okay. coffee. Fuel. Thank you. Because we're down at low level, we can't use any autopilot, so we're physically handling the aircraft at 250 feet often using up to 60 degrees angle of bank. So it's, it's quite an aggressive way to handle such a large aircraft. Birds left low underneath us now. Oh yeah, clear. Sunset crossing the ridge line about two miles on the nose. Oh, 
The exercise may be a dangerous manoeuvre, but the adrenaline kick is high. Yeah, Roger, turn the inside down. That's six minutes still okay. I think flying is, is one of the greatest jobs in the world. As a captain, you get a 40 million pound aircraft signed to you and told to, to go out and take care of it. You just feel like you're out there with your friends and, and the office is the sky and you can just hang out and nobody's really breathing down your neck. Roger. Well, outside door funnel. After an intense morning of training, it's back to Bryce Norton. Everyone that flies the Herc grows to love it because it's a, it's a plane that'll always take care of you. It's, it's a nice relationship with the airplane, knowing that you can trust it as long as you take good care of it. The Hercules is also the aircraft of choice to dispatch troops via parachute into difficult territory. In number one parachute training school, a group of Territorial Army trainees are nervously waiting to perform their first jump from 1,000 feet. These young, part-time soldiers are keen to make the grade and serve together on the front line. He's first at the door. <laughs> You're first at the door. Am I? Aye. Aye. When did you become a flight master? I just decided. <laughs> did you? <laughs> I'm no first at the door. <laughs> the group of friends will be leaping into the unknown, travelling at 200 miles per hour with 80 pounds of equipment. A jump which will put their recently learnt drills to the test. Sorry? When you get out of the aircraft initially, into the, into the slipstream of the aircraft, um, often people turn off at that point. That's why we drop them at 1,000 feet, the highest. This is to be the highest jump they'll do. So they get a little bit of time to switch back onto what they're doing, because that would be a massive overload for them. Injuries do happen, and paramedics are on standby at the nearby drop zone at Western on the Green. Its size and flatness are ideal for first-time parachutists, who may struggle to control their canopies. We work on a 2% per course injury basis, not necessarily a broken leg. Um, but definitely injuries and dislocations and stuff like that. You think about how fast they're coming down, 19.5 feet per second. Yeah, it's a massive impact when they land on the ground. Back at Bryce Norton, there's no going back for the Territorial Army trainees. Run it over and done with. Not nervous. Yeah, good. Yeah, very excited. Six minutes. Six minutes. Doors are open, they stood in the door, three old red on, and they'll get the green on any second now. And it'll be out, there he goes. So it's my first man. Rule number one is keeping your legs together. You're right, mate. Yeah. Calm makes the ground safely. It, it was good. Once you're in the air, uh, it's quite calm up, up until you get into the uh, aircraft doors. You feel the rush of the air, and then uh, it really, really kicks in. The adrenaline starts pumping. Kerr is next to jump, followed by Sharp with his fear of heights. Awesome. Quicker than I thought it was going to be, but I... The descent was fine, the landing was fine. I've conquered my fear of heights to a certain extent, yes. Yeah, so I've got enough four to go. So far, so good. Khan, Kerr, Lister and Sharp have all passed their first jump. But there's no respite. After a debrief, the group need to get back to base for their second jump. Every jump is a progression, so every jump becomes more and more difficult for them. So yeah, they have something different to think about every time. Now they're getting lower and lower and lower, more stuff to do in the air, and a short amount of time to do it. Next, 
Sharp has a rigging emergency at 800 feet. Get tight! Get tight! And the trainees perform their first night jump. This is the lowest jump that Laird have done, 600 feet, and they won't be able to see the ground. At RAF Bryce Norton, a group of Territorial Army trainees are undergoing parachute training in preparation for a tour of duty alongside regular soldiers. If they pass, these volunteer reservists will soon be leaving behind their normal UK lives to serve in Afghanistan. With his day job as a doctor, Mo Khan will routinely be in front of the exit line. In combat, medics always jump first to prepare to treat any injuries that may follow. Get your legs underneath you! At the moment you landed, you put your feet apart, which you can't, you can't roll off of that. We need you alive anyway, sir, because you're the only one that can, uh, can fix all the guys if they hurt themselves. So yeah, don't do that again. Despite his bad landing, Khan passed jump two. Next up, 21-year-old Michael Lister has steering problems, but manages to regain control in time for landing. How was that? Yeah, it was better than the first one, sir. How many handfuls did you get? Yeah, I've got one. I couldn't, couldn't get a good grip. OK, so you failed that descent. OK, but don't worry about it. OK, keep your chin up. There's going to be loads of guys in the same situation as yourself. OK, just get a signature at the bottom there. Keep your head up, mate. I'll have a chat with you when you get to the top. I felt really nervous. I was thinking, what am I doing up here? It just looks like I'll have to do an extra jump. I might have to stay here a bit longer than expected. Finally, it's the turn of Sharp, who's given up his job in a coffee shop to follow his dream of serving with his mates. But he exits badly, head first, twisting his rigging lines. Hey. Out of control and struggling to unwind them, he forgets his landing drill. Stop kicking! Bunday tries to alert him. Stop kicking! Get tight! Get tight! Get tight! Number one, get tight! Get tight! Get tight! You have a shocking exit, mate. Shocking. I think you must have fallen out of the aircraft. I let go of my equipment and then I attempted to try and get with the twists. That was a fail. Um, the reason you failed, you weren't aware of your height. I shouted at you and when you did get, when you stopped kicking, that's how you landed. Cross-footed, man. No matter what happens, you've got to get tight. You're a lucky man. You're lucky that you got both your legs intact now. Had a bad exit. I knew right away something was wrong, but I annoyed myself because I didn't do the right drill, you know what I mean? I've been doing the drills the past four days now. It can be quite frustrating, you know? He'll come back and do that jump again. There's no way he was going to pass that. I don't think my mum would have uh, passed him on that one and she don't know anything about parachuting. Sharp has now got to go back up and pass his second jump if he wants to make the grade and deploy to Afghanistan with his mates. Oh, you need to be absolutely mental to go through what I've just been through and then go back up again, but the name of the job in it. But at the last moment, his nerves get the better of him and Sharp decides not to jump. We've got a refusal, OK? You just take him up, leave his kit here, put it there and then put him in the crew deck. Yeah. I don't really want him near anyone, that's all. He's moved into isolation at the front of the Hercules. This is standard practice to prevent other trainees getting nervous and refusing to jump. Sharp was number three in the first stick. Um, decided he didn't want to go again, poor bloke. It's not for everybody. There's a million people out there that would have had exactly the same reaction to him on having such a, such a bad last descent, so you can't hold it against him. Um, yeah, so that's, that's him. That's him gone now. Sharp is off the course putting on hold his dream to go to the front line with his mates. As night falls on RAF Bryce Norton, the part-time soldiers all need to complete their crucial night jump from just 600 feet 
to get their wings. Army Dr Khan is feeling confident. This is going to be my last jump. I'm kind of thinking about my wings a little bit. I know I shouldn't, but uh, it's kind of in the back of my mind. But I'll be happy to get out there, get on the ground. And Lister, who successfully caught up, is feeling the pressure. I think we'll have to buy someone a drink. Don't know who, like, but... Uh, we'll have to buy someone a drink. They'll be apprehensive, uh, as, as they have been with all of them. Uh, this is the lowest jump that Lael have done, 600 feet, and they'll be uh, fully aware that uh, they're not going to be able to spot their landing. They won't be able to see the ground coming. The only thing that will give the, uh, the landing away is their kit hitting the ground just before they do. In a war zone, paratroopers will often make their descent under cover of darkness. So this jump is a vital part of their training. Trainees all get down safely. Ah, didn't see a thing coming out. Well, I put the chute out, operated. It's a clean, clean opening, so that was amazing. <laughs> Better than the last one. I thought the last one was the best, wasn't it? That's the best. Everyone's passed. Everyone's airborne now. Yeah, it's cool. No injuries. Yeah, the only the hardest bit for these guys will be finding their way back. Successful course, successful day, successful night, successful descents. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. But it's not just the RAF instructor who's relieved. His trainees have cause for celebration too, as they receive their hard-earned wings after this condensed course. First in line, Mo Khan. Well done. Thanks. I'm glad we didn't need your services. No, but, uh, there's your wings. I was always ready. <laughs> then student Kerr. Congratulations. Had a good course. Yeah, Enjoyed great. it. Yeah, great. Well done. Thanks and 21-year-old lifeguard Lister. Well, well done. Been lucky. It's uh, you know, a very rare occasion to get through plans that quick, so well I've got my wings really chuffed. Uh, with it being my uh, birthday a couple of days ago as well, it's like an excellent birthday present, uh, a late birthday present, shall I say. These part-time soldiers will now await their deployment to Afghanistan, including Sharp who, although he failed his wings, has been allowed to go to Afghanistan in a force protection role. So he will be joining his mates on a tour of duty after all. So, well done, fellas. Let's go home. Well done, guys. <laughs> See you tomorrow. There's a suitably explosive ending to a young doctor's notebook over on Sky Arts 1 HD next in the series finale. And that's followed by a behind the scenes special. Meanwhile, on Sky Living HD, things could be about to blow up for Dracula as it's time for his electricity display to shine. But his enemies have other plans.